Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn why we have the spanning tree protocol. And to understand why we need to have it, I need to first start off with a review of Ethernet path selection. So we've got our example network topology on the left hand side here again. And our layer two Ethernet path selection is controlled by the switches MAC address tables. So let's see how those are built and how it works. In this example, I'm going to cover here, PC1 wants to send traffic to the 10.10.10.2 IP address on R1. And in this example, I'll cover what would happen if we didn't have spanning tree, and then you'll understand why we need to have it. So PC1, it hasn't spoken to R1 before, so it sends an ARP request for 10.10.10.2. That goes out with a source MAC of 1.1.1, the MAC address on PC1, and a destination MAC of f.f.f because it's broadcast traffic. So PC1 sends that out and it will hit switch access 3. Access 3 learns that MAC address 1.1.1 is available via interface fast 0 slash 1 because it saw that as the source MAC address in the incoming frame. Any subsequent traffic that is going to 1.1.1 that hits switch access 3 will be forwarded out port fast 0 slash 1. Switch access free floods that broadcast ARP request out all ports apart from the one it was received on. So it goes out interfaces fast 0 slash 24 and fast 0 slash 21. Switched CD1 learns that MAC address 1.1.1 is available via interface fast 0 slash 24 when that ARP request comes in. And when it comes into switch CD2, it learns that the MAC address 1.1.1 is available via its interface fast0 slash 21. So you can see that the MAC address tables are getting built on the switches here as traffic hits them. Any subsequent traffic for 1.1.1 that hits either CD1 or CD2 will be forwarded out those relevant ports. Switch CD1 floods the broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one that it was received on there and the traffic will then reach R1. It also reaches CD2 and Axis 4. R1 will respond to the ARP request. CD1 learns that MAC address 2.2.2 on R1 is available via interface gig 0 slash 1 from that ARP reply. So any subsequent traffic for 2.2.2 will be forwarded out that port. So switch CD1 now knows the best ports to send traffic out for both R1 and for PC1. Switch CD1 already knows to forward that ARP request for 1.1.1 out towards PC1 on interface fast 0 slash 24. It comes into switch access 3 and it learns that MAC address 2.2.2, the source address and the ARP reply from R1, is available via interface fast 0 slash 24. So any subsequent traffic for 2.2.2 that hits switch access 3 will be forwarded out port fast 0 slash 24. And we now have end to end path selection in both directions between PC1 and R1 going through the switches access 3. Three and CD1 and the switches know which port to send the traffic out of. But there is a problem here and to understand it let's go back to the start to when the ARP request from PC1 first came in to the switch access 3. 
So switch access free received that ARP request from PC1 and it floods the broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on. This is if we don't have spanning tree. So that includes port fast 0 slash 24 facing CD1 and the port facing CD2 as well. Switch CD1 receives the ARP request from Access 3 and it floods the broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on. That includes going out its interface gig 0 slash 2 towards CD2. CD2 does the same thing. It floods the broadcast traffic out all ports apart from the one it was received on and that includes port fast 0 slash 21 which is facing back towards switch Access 3 again. The traffic comes into Access 3 and Access 3 sends the traffic back to CD1 again, which will then send it back to CD2, which will then send it back to Access 3 and so on and so on. So we now have a loop running clockwise between the Access 3, CD1 and CD2 switches. Whenever we've got broadcast traffic, it's going to keep looping between the three of them. But it doesn't end there. The broadcast traffic was also forwarded out interface fast 0 slash 21 by Axis 3 when the ARP request came in. So we also have a loop running counterclockwise between Axis 3, CD2 and CD1. So you can see the ARP request comes in, Axis 3 sends it to CD2, CD2 sends it to CD1, CD1 to Axis 3, Axis 3 back to CD2 and so on. We have loops running in both directions, both clockwise and and counterclockwise between Axis 3, CD1 and CD2. Still, it doesn't stop there because the broadcast traffic was also forwarded out interface fast 0 slash 21 by switch CD1. So we also have a loop running counterclockwise between CD1, Axis 4 and CD2. And the broadcast traffic was also flooded out interface fast 0 slash 24 by CD2. So we also have a loop running clockwise between CD2, Axis 4 and CD1. So just like we have two loops running clockwise and counterclockwise between Axis 3, CD1 and CD2, we have the same thing, two loops running clockwise and counterclockwise between Axis 4, CD1 and CD2. So we've got four loops running through the network here. And the layer 2 ethernet header does not have a TTL time to live field to stop the looping traffic like our layer 3 IP header does. So on a layer 2 network, if you get traffic looping, it will loop forever. There's nothing to stop that happening. But if you do get a loop happening, the way you can stop it is by physically going and unplugging a cable. And there's going to be more broadcast traffic on our network than just that single ARP request from PC1 going to R1. There's going to be loads of other broadcast traffic as well, like other ARP requests, DHCP requests, etc. And if we do have loops on the network, with all that broadcast traffic going around, we're going to get a broadcast storm. The network will crash because the amount of looping broadcast traffic will quickly overwhelm the switch's CPU and the bandwidth. So if you do get a broadcast storm on your network, it's devastating for the network. It will stop the network from working. So a broadcast storm obviously must be avoided at all costs. And the way that we do avoid it is by using the spanning tree protocol. It's used to prevent any layer two loops. It does that by detecting any potential loops and blocking ports to prevent them. In our example network, you can see on the diagram on the left, if you look at the different links, you notice there's a couple that are highlighted in red rather than in green. Port fast 0 slash 21 on switch access 3 is highlighted in red. So it's been blocked to prevent the loops both clockwise and counterclockwise that were running between CD1, CD2 and access 3. We also had that other loop between access 4, CD1 and CD2 as well. So on that side, 
port fast 0 slash 24 on axis 4 switch has been blocked. So spanning T, it will detect potential loops and it will block a port to break the loop. But if you look at it now, before from axis 3, if both uplinks, fast 0 slash 24 and fast 0 slash 21 were up, if we weren't blocking any ports, then we would be able to send traffic upstream to both CD1 and CD2 via the fast 0 slash 24 and the fast 0 slash 21 interfaces. Let's say that those are one gig interfaces, we would have had two gigs worth of uplink bandwidth. But because one of those ports has been shut down, we're only using half of our available physically connected uplink bandwidth. We've only got one gig's worth of uplink connectivity rather than two gig. So spanning tree, it actually shuts down physically cabled interfaces. It reduces the amount of bandwidth that you have available. So it's an evil, but it's a necessary evil because if we got a broadcast storm, the network wouldn't work at all. So that would obviously be a far worse scenario. Spanning tree automates failover as well as performing loop prevention. So if an access layer switches uplink to CD1 fails, you see in the example here on both access 3 and access 4, those switches where available uplink is the one facing towards CD1. The core distribution layer 2, CD2 switch, both the uplinks from our access layer switches to it are blocking right now to prevent the loops. But if switch CD1 goes down or the links to CD1 go down, spanning tree will detect that and it will fail the uplinks over to using CD2 instead. But we already covered one of the bad things about spanning tree, which is it limits the amount of bandwidth you have by shutting down interfaces that are actually physically cabled. Another bad thing about spanning tree is it typically has a slow convergence time. It can actually take up to 50 seconds to converge. So spanning tree, it's got some bad things about it, but it's absolutely necessary in networks because it's far more important to ensure that we don't have any layer two loops. But we would like to minimize the use of spanning tree if we can. I'll get into some methods we can use to do that at the end of the next section. In this section, as a network engineer, you have to understand spanning tree. So the rest of this section will go through how spanning tree works, how to configure it. And by the end of that, you'll also understand how to troubleshoot it as well. So see you in the next lecture for how spanning tree actually works. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad free right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.